All right. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. We are officially recording now. So, um, first up, uh, if you haven't already done so, um, please take this opportunity to go ahead and check your audio. If you're having any trouble or you don't have a headset or speakers, feel free to call in by phone. The number is 1-415-655-0000. And then you just enter an access code, which is 926-342-392, and then the pound sign. And that's up there on the screen for you as well. And um, I did put it into the chat earlier, but for those of you um, that may have logged in after I did that, here it is again. All right. Let me get my slides going. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, this is the third webinar of our 2018 IGNIS season. We have five webinars this season. We're on number three. And for those of you that haven't joined us before, IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's exactly what we're hoping to do today is to ignite your curiosity and to spark your intellect. And we've got a great presentation coming up for you today. Uh, this webinar series is brought to you by the Office of E-Learning and Open Education at the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And your hosts today are myself, Alyssa Sells, and Mark Carbon. And you'll be hearing from Mark here in just a minute. And we'll share out our contact information with you on one of the slides at the end of the webinar. So if you need to contact us, you can. So our topic today is... Um, on the ins and outs of um, securing online assessments. And our presenter is Zoe Fisher. Um, big thank you out to Zoe for sharing her knowledge and expertise with us this afternoon. And we're glad she was able to get logged back in and get some audio today. Um, also, please note that all of our webinars will be captioned. And I just want to give a shout out and a thank you to ACS for their real-time captioning services. And I am going to put a link into the chat for everyone. And this is um, the link to the captions for this webinar. You can just go to that link. It's a bit.ly link. It's bit.ly slash ignis, I-G-N-I-S dash live, L-I-V-E, and that's all uppercase. Uh, if you need keyboard shortcuts or prefer to use your keyboard rather than your mouse, I'm going to put um, the help sheet on that into uh, the chat as well. So we should all be set and ready to go. In case you're curious, we do record all of our webinars and you can access those recordings on the ATL blog. And um, let me give you that as well. Lots of links here to get started. I just want to make sure that everybody has all the resources they need. So you can access that um, at bit.ly slash ignis, again, all uppercase, I-G-N-I-S, 2018, dash recordings with a capital R. All right, let's keep moving here. Uh, you can also find the full ignis schedule there on the blog as well. You just need to select the schedule rather than the recordings from that drop-down menu. Okay, we have switched web conferencing tools this year, and we do like to do just a little review at the beginning of each of the webinars um, just to get everybody familiar with the interface. And I'll run through that real quick, and then I'm going to hand it over to Mark, who is going to officially introduce Zoe, and then we'll uh, let Zoe loose, and she'll just, um, she's going to wow and amaze you today. All right, so here's a little tour of the meeting interface. You can find the list of participants and the participant tools in the participant panel, and that's on the upper right of your screen. And you may need to um, close or expand um, some of these um, using those little drop-down arrows um, just in case you're not seeing everything. We will be using the chat feature today, so do get ready to type. So we've got some um, questions to ask you, and she's looking forward to getting your responses. And as we go, feel free to uh, type your comments and questions 
comes into the chat panel, and that is near the bottom right of your screen. Or you can also raise your hand if you'd prefer to ask your question verbally. You will need to turn your mic on in order to do that. I do have everybody except um, Zoe and myself muted right now. Um, if you are sending messages um, to us, please be sure to select everyone from the drop-down menu if it doesn't default there. That way uh, we can all see what you have to say. All right, um, there are also some WebEx help things that you can access, and that is um, near the top middle of your screen. There's a link there that you can click on um, that's called help. That's pretty easy. And then um, if you're having trouble seeing the screens, because sometimes depending on the size of your screen, um, the slides can get kind of sl uh, small. I know I have trouble with that sometimes. So if you would prefer to uh, watch the webinar in full screen, um, you can click on um, the little expansion arrows, and um, that's near the top middle of your screen as well. And that will pop you right into a full screen view of um, Zoe's presentation today. All right, let me get to our next slide here. There's just a little bit of delay moving. Um, and then um, once you're in full screen, uh, if you want to exit out of there, because sometimes um, when it's in full screen, you can't see all the tools. If you hover near the top of your screen, a little toolbar will pop down for you. And um, there's a button there that's labeled return. That's on your upper left. You can click that button, or you can use escape to um, exit out of um, the full screen view. OK, so in participant tools, um, you, you can raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. Um, so feel free to raise your hand, and then we will call on you. And um, sometimes we use hand raising for polling, but I don't think Zoe has any of those questions in her presentation today. So I think we're just using chat. So you don't need to worry too much about that. And then um, you'll want to use um, the microphone button to mute and unmute yourself. Again, I do have um, everyone on mute right now. So um, your buttons are probably red. And if you're going to speak, um, you just need to click on your microphone button, and that will unmute your mic for us. All right, I am going to turn it over to Mark now, who is going to introduce Zoe for us. And while Mark is doing that, I'm going to go ahead and make Zoe a presenter and switch over to her slides. So um, Mark, you are up. Hey, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to get Zoe started here, so some good topics today. Well, Zoe comes to us from uh, Pierce College here in Washington. Um, she's been previously was a tenured faculty librarian at Pierce, uh, specializing in teaching information, literacy, reading, and college success. Currently, she is the instructional designer for Pierce College. Uh, she consults and assists faculty with development of courses, focusing on those same kind of topics, bringing in the literacy, the reading, college success. Um, she is uh, kind of focused on that for a number of years now with uh, the pedagogy and the student learning and even in her, uh, her own work because her research is kind of a shows uh, those uh, same things and, and building upon privacy and ethics in education as well. So Zoe has a master's degree in library science and as well as a uh, bachelor's degree. Um, in her spare time, Zoe is, uh, writes memoirs, essays, short stories, and poetry in young adult novels. Um, it was first published at 17 years old, which is, is exciting to see. And it was uh, Please Don't Kill the Freshman, a memoir. So, and uh, if you want to find out more about some of her writings and some of the work she's doing, um, she has a, uh, we'll put it, I think Alyssa can throw that in the chat for us, but we have a URL to quickaskzoe.com. Yep, so with that, take it away, Zoe. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Zoe Fisher, and I'm an instructional designer at Pierce College. Today's session is titled, To Lock or Not to Lock, Using Respondus for Secure Assessment. So if you haven't met me before, you heard um, a little bit about me from Mark. Uh, as it was mentioned, I've been an information literacy librarian. I've worked mostly in community colleges over the past six years. Um, just recently in January, I moved to a role um, in faculty and employee development as an instructional designer at Pierce College. I've taught online in Canvas since 2013, so I do have some experience teaching online. 
And I mentioned my background and kind of my approach to teaching because it informs my approach to the subject. I'm an online educator and a community college educator, but I'm also a librarian. And the thing that I found is that whatever choices faculty make and instructors make in their classes, the librarians always know about it because students come to the library when they have questions and need help with their classes. And that's actually how I got interested in this topic. Um, it was based on a question I got from a student. But we'll go ahead and move to the next slide, um, or the next page here. I just wanted us to take a moment and share a bit about ourselves. So if you'd like to use the chat box at this point, you're invited to do so. Um, you could include where you teach and what you teach and how you teach. If you're an instructional designer or an e-learning administrator in some other educational role, you're welcome to share that too. It's just kind of helpful for me to know who's um, with us today in the webinar so that I can um, you know, tailor some of the comments to the folks we have here. So I'll give you a moment to share if you'd like to do that um, in the chat box, and then, uh, then we'll move on. So I'll give you a minute to type if you'd like to do that. Excellent. So we've got a couple of folks sharing in the in the chat box. We've got um, someone who teaches nutrition 100% online, um, e-learning coordinator who's taught English online in the past. If anybody else wants to, to jump in and introduce themselves and share their role, they're, they're welcome to. Um, an instructional designer. Excellent. Um, we've got someone who teaches business classes online, another professor who teaches economics online. Keep going in the chat box if you'd like to share. I'm curious to see who's here, but just for the sake of time, I'm going to have us move along to the next page if you want to keep us going. So um, while you're introducing yourselves, I'll just tell the story that got me interested in this topic. I was working at Green River College last quarter, and it was a couple weeks into the quarter, so I think maybe early October, and a student approached me at the reference desk and asked where she could take her test. And she described what she needed. She said she needed to take the test online on a computer, but she needed to install some software called Respondus that would lock down her browser. She said she also needed a computer with a webcam because she would be recorded during the test. Um, and she wanted to know if she could take the test in the library. At the time, I'd never heard of anything like this, so I wasn't familiar with online proctoring. Um, and I knew in my gut that this wasn't something that we could do for the student in the library, unfortunately, because we didn't have computers with webcams. Um, she also said, you know, there couldn't be any movement in the background and there couldn't be anything else going on around her. So as she was describing what she needed, I, I felt kind of bad that I didn't, I didn't know where we could do that for her on campus. Um, but I also was just very surprised by what she was asking for because I'd never heard of it before. So that really got me interested in what is going on with um, online proctoring and securing online exams and, and what does that look like for students and, and why are faculty doing this. So that's kind of how I got interested in, in the topic. Um, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next uh, page here. And I'll just tell you quickly what you'll get out of today's session, I hope. Um, by the end of the session, you should be able to discuss how you assess student learning in your own teaching. Um, identify the purpose of secure assessment and how online proctoring works. We're going to use Lockdown Browser um, and the Respondus product kind of as an example, um, but I'm not focusing on it as much as you might think from the title of the session. We'll also evaluate the ways that secure assessment can impact equity and hinder accessibility for students. And we'll very briefly discuss ethics and privacy as issues in secure assessment. So that's kind of big picture of what we're going for today. Um, we're going to move on and do a little more chatting if, you, if you'd like to. I love um, folks who are sharing in the chat box already. So go on to the next screen for the, the prompt. Just quickly, I'd love it if you could share um, one or two ways that you assess student learning in your classes. Now, you don't have to list everything. I know you've got lots of different kinds of assessments. But maybe in the chat box, just give a couple examples of how you, how do you know students are learning in your courses. So 
So I've got a couple folks who are sharing some examples in the chat box. Um, assignments, exams, online quizzes, um, discussions, the phrase hands-on, practice assignments has come up a couple times, um, exams, homework, discussions. Um, someone says they rarely use exams, they mostly use project-based assignments, and another person gives the example of Quizlet. Those are all excellent examples, so I'm going to move us on to the next piece, um, which is related, so if you're still throwing out assessment examples, that's fine. But just thinking about one of the ways that you give um, assessments to students, how could a student possibly cheat with that assessment? You don't need to give any colorful stories, um, but just speaking generically, you know, if, um, uh, if you assign an exam, you know, do you have rules around how that exam is taken and could a student um, cheat on that exam or if you have practice assignments, um, you know, what would be an example of how somebody, if they were motivated to do so, could, could cheat with that. So folks are sharing some great examples in the chat box. Um, they're saying students could use unauthorized materials. Um, someone says impersonation, so they could have somebody else pretend to be them and, and do the assignment and take the test for them. Um, someone says copying and pasting someone else's code on a web page design project, uh, using the internet to find answers, or using a computer and a phone during testing time, uh, working with other students. So absolutely, if you've specified this work should be done alone, but they're sitting there and collaborating to get it done. Um, that would be dishonest. Um, so another example would be Googling for answers. Um, all good examples. I'm glad we're, we're thinking about those and kind of have those in the back of our minds. Um, I'm going to move this on to the next piece here. And this is just kind of a key point I wanted to make as we get going with our conversation today. No assessment method is cheat proof, and this is not a purpose of this session to give you um, the foolproof examples are the way to cheat proof your exams and assessments. If someone is really determined to be academically dishonest, they will find ways to do it. Um, so I just want to throw that out there, and it sounds like we all have experience with that. There's a question, though, that comes up a lot, you know, is cheating more frequent in online courses? And I wanted to address that with a couple of studies that I found. Um, so if we look at the, the next slide, um, there's a survey that they did of 225 students at a private Christian college, and they gave the survey to students in face-to-face -face classes as well as online classes there. And through the survey, they found that students, um, by their own admission, were, were more likely to engage in cheating behaviors if they were in face-to-face -face classes. Um, so that survey found actually was more likely in face-to-face -face classes. Another survey um, was done um, just after that that included undergraduate and graduate students um, but came to the same conclusion that it was more likely in face-to-face -face courses. There's some thinking that this is because in face-to-face -face classes, students are more likely to form friendships or be in classes with their friends and then more likely to engage in sharing or collaborative behaviors that might not be allowed, which is less likely to happen in online environments. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. A couple studies found that it's not actually more common in online education. Another thing I was curious about was, you know, with these proctoring tools, with online um, proctoring software or remote proctoring, um, do people still cheat in those situations? Um, and this is kind of an interesting study that was done by a company that offers online proctoring. So the company is called Examity, um, and they offer online proctoring where they actually have someone uh, watch the student take the exam via webcam. Um, so if we look at the next um, page here, um, oh, yes, I wanted to talk about this too. So the other funny thing I have to point out, I, I put this slide in here, was um, if you look up any of these proctoring companies, these proctoring tools, if you Google them, the top Google results are how to cheat with them. So I just thought that was kind of funny, you know, it kind of goes back to our previous point of if people are determined to do this, they will find a way. Um, and there's lots of knowledge sharing online about how to get around these tools. So I won't go into that, but I just think that's kind of funny that those are the top results when you Google these companies. So Examity um, is, like I said, a company that offers online proctoring, and they analyzed 62,000, over 62,000 exams 
that have been online proctored through their company. And they found um, in their results, they looked to see how many students still tried to cheat uh, even when their exam was proctored online. So the next page uh, shows um, the percentage of cases where students were found to have violated the rules of the exam. So in this case, 6%, uh, which is pretty small, but at the same time, these were students who knew they were being um, proctored, they were being watched via webcam. Uh, so the next page has uh, some examples, I think, of what they found. Um, these are kind of funny, I think. Um, in some of the extreme cases, uh, a parent hid under a test taker's desk to get answers. Answers were coughed in Morse code outside of the room. Uh, there was a cheat sheet hidden in a baby's bassinet. Uh, one student had a coughing fit to induce a cheat sheet in hidden in their throat. Um, and someone hired a professional ringer to take the exam. So in this case, you know, a, a student sat, sat there and pretended to be the student in the class to take the exam. Um, kind of funny, but just gets back to the point that was made earlier that if people are really determined to do this, they will. On the next page, um, there were some trends that they found across these this six percent of cases. Um, these are the top three ways that they found where stu students were cheating in their online exams. They were using um, notes or cheat sheets, um, or they were using Google Search or Google Translate. They also found a few other things that people are doing besides those top three. Um, so on the next page, I think there's a couple more examples. Um, taking down or copying the test questions to share with other people hiding flashcards on the keyboard or hanging answers um, on the wall. So those are some of the, the common behaviors um, that they found. And then on the next page, just a thought to keep in mind as we move forward. We know that cheating happens, even in cases where folks are using online proctoring. Um, so what can faculty do? And this is the conclusion I came to. So on, on the next page, it says, um, thinking about how to secure your assessments as part of designing your learning experience. And this is the philosophy that I come from, that, you know, learning outcomes and assessments as part of instructional design. Um, so even a step beyond this on the, on the next screen, even if you take out a couple of those words in the middle, <laughs> thinking about your assessments as part of designing your learning experience. And so big picture, um, you have learning outcomes, you have to decide how you want to assess those. And I think securing your assessments is part of that, but there's a lot of different factors to weigh, and that's part of what I wanted to have a conversation about today. Um, so we'll move on. Um, these are some guiding questions that I use, and I would encourage all faculty and all instructors to use these questions when they think about um, assessments in online or face-to-face -face classes. But why do you use that assessment? Um, what do you like about it or dislike about it? Which learning outcomes from your course does it measure? Do you find the assessment valuable? Does it tell you something meaningful as a teacher? But I think the other interesting thing to think about is do your students find the assessment valuable? Um, and it's my um, experience that if students find the assessment valuable, if there's something interesting about it or useful to them, they're probably more likely to engage in it and I think to do it um, honestly and ethically. But if it's the kind of assessment where maybe you're looking at it and going, I don't know why I use this, I was just told to use it, I think it measures some of my learning outcomes, but I haven't really looked at it too closely, I'm kind of annoyed with this assessment, I don't find it that valuable, your students definitely are going to pick up on that, and they probably won't find it as valuable either, in which case they may approach it with an attitude of, let's just get through this as quickly as possible because it doesn't really matter. The other thing to keep in mind um, on the next page, yeah, this page is, um, and this is just a general philosophy I have, is to weigh your options before deciding to embrace technological solutions to pedagogical problems. I know that sounds obvious, especially for folks uh, in the webinar who've been in e-learning for a long time, but um, I think faculty can find academic dishonesty and cheating really frustrating. It can really aggravate instructors. And I think it can be tempting to say, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna lock down all my quizzes, or I'm gonna use Procter & Software, and that's gonna solve it. Um, we just saw, though, it doesn't catch every case, <laughs> um, so it's not going to make um, your assessments cheat-proof. And it can also create some other problems. So I think there's advantages to it, but it's worth weighing your options and thinking about other approaches before you embrace that technological solution. 
This is perfect, yeah. So one piece that does come up is important to think about, of course, is regulations and accreditation and auditing. Um, the Higher Education Opportunity Act of 2008 requires that institutions ensure that students who register um, in a distance education program is the same student who actually participates in and completes the academic credit. Um, makes sense, right? We want to make sure the people who register for our online classes are the people who are actually taking them. But of course, because this is the government, um, if you look at the next page, they don't really tell you exactly how to do this. Um, the exact language from their um, recommendations that just came out this year suggest that this process might include using a secure login and passcode, proctored examinations, and I love this part, new or other technologies and practices that are effective in verifying the identity of students. Um, so it leaves us really open-ended, and it doesn't tell institutions exactly what to do or, or how to do it, but that concept is there and that is important. I wanted to acknowledge that. So I think we have to, as institutions, um, find solutions that, that meet that requirement. For folks today who aren't familiar with some of these online proctoring tools, I wanted to take a moment to explain a little bit about how they work and what they offer. Um, as a reminder, I'm not a vendor representative. I don't represent any of these companies or any of these products, but I just want to talk broadly about what they do. So with that um, Higher Education Opportunity Act regulation in mind, some of the products you'll find out there will do things like um, restrict computer capabilities during a test so that users can't do other things on their computers while they're taking the test. So it'll restrict browsing and the use of other programs. Um, another thing that, um, that these programs will do is uh, identity, identity off, excuse me, authentication, um, which might include photo ID being held up next to a student's face. Um, or using some kind of biometric information to verify that it's a student. So some programs have something called biometric keystrokes. So they um, kind of evaluate how that individual types and make sure that it's the person who's doing the typing. Um, the other thing that they will do is monitor the actual testing environment. So in this case, the student would need to use their webcam to show what's visible or available in the testing environment, like under the desk or on their walls. Um, so in, this is the example, you know, to show that there's no extra information around. They're not using cheat sheets. They don't have notes posted on the wall or something like that. Um, and then the other piece that some of these products offer is actually monitoring behavior during a test. So watching a student's movements, listening to noises, it'll actually record audio to make sure that people aren't doing things like coughing answers in Morse code, um, or to make sure that students aren't looking away at a cell phone or at the wall where their notes, notes are posted. Um, so those are some of the ways that these products uh, secure the online testing environment. So basically by locking down the computer, um, verifying identity, and then monitoring the testing environment and the test taker themselves. I want to talk for just a moment about um, Respondus, which was the tool that kind of um, started this, this conversation for me. There's two different tools that, that they offer. One is a product called Lockdown Browser, and you can see a screenshot there from their website. Um, it's software that the student has to install that locks down the testing environment within online courses. So um, once students have that browser activated, they can't Google answers, they can't flip over to, um, you know, another screen to, to look at something else. So it just locks down their, their browser, but, um, you know, a student could still be holding a cell phone in their lap and be looking up answers that way or something like that. The other product that Respondus um, offers is Monitor which is not um, live proctoring, but it takes a recording of the test that faculty can watch. So if you are concerned what a student may have been doing during a test or you want to review their behavior, you can watch a recording of the student actually taking um, the test through their webcam. So those are a couple of the products that offer some of the things that, that we just talked about, the different ways of securing the online environment. One of the things I was curious about was, okay, well, what's the actual impact um, on student grades? And I found this study um, from Miami University, and they found it had a really big impact. So students who used proctoring software took less time and earned significantly lower scores than students who took unproctored online exams. And so they're thinking that, um, you know, you earned the lower score because you weren't looking up the right answer somewhere else. Also that um, the the test took less time to take because you weren't slowed down by 
using other materials or collaborating or getting answers from someone else. Um, there's an interesting part in their conclusion that I wanted to show you um, because they actually looked at the distinction between uh, using webcam proctoring or not. And they found that lock, this is the part that's, that's highlighted if you're looking at your screen, lockdown software without video monitoring did not have the same impact. So folks who had um, video monitoring as part of their proctoring actually had significantly lower grades. And the interesting conclusion here, the way the authors wrote it, if you um, go to the next page, you can see kind of this highlight of the, the conclusion. They, they wrote that they felt that this was probably because it deters cheating. Um, I think this is actually worth further research. Um, you know, how do students feel? What is their experience taking a test, knowing that they're being watched via video monitor? Does it possibly make some students more anxious, which could lead to lower grades? Um, I'm sure that it does reduce some academic dishonesty, but the fact that it has such a significant impact, I think is actually really interesting and it warrants further study and further research. But um, the short end of it is like, yes, it does seem to have an impact and it does um, lower grades overall. The general rule of thumb from what I read was that if you can't use proctoring software because your institution doesn't use it or it's not something that you have access to, um, there are other ways that faculty can make their tests harder to take. So some of the um, suggestions that I read said that faculty should do things like randomizing your answers or putting a time limit on questions. Narrowing the time of day that a user can take the test is also an option. So instead of having it available all day, we make it available for like two hours or something like that. Uh, other options include locking the questions so that students can only see one at a time. Also limiting the number of attempts on the test and not allowing students to see the correct answers. Um, so that way they don't know what they got right or wrong and they can't share answers. And this is really labor intensive, but you know, using new exams with new questions each quarter. These are some of the, the strategies that you can use that don't involve um, online proctoring or locking down a browser, but would make your exam much more difficult to take and, and more difficult to, to be academically dishonest. But something I think about with all those options is that making your tests harder to take can also create equity and accessibility issues. And in general, the trade-off in my mind is that a test with fewer obstacles is more accessible. Of course, if there's fewer obstacles for the learner, that could possibly mean more academic dishonesty. In terms of how your choices might impact student success, I think it's important to consider that timed questions, randomizing answers, limiting the time window for exams, all of those things could create barriers for learners with disabilities, people with family, people who work. So for example, if you only offer your test from 2 to 4 p.m. on a Thursday, um, that narrow time window would discourage collaboration and cheating maybe, but um, it could also be really difficult for somebody who needs to rearrange a work schedule or find childcare. So, the other response I hear from faculty is, oh, you know, but I always work with students who have accommodations. Of course. I mean, absolutely, we all do. But we know that students um, with disabilities don't always register their disabilities and ask for accommodations. Um, you also don't get accommodations for having um, a family or for having work. So I think that, you know, there are accessibility issues that will come up even if you do work with accommodations. And there are equity issues um, for which there would never be accommodations. So the questions I would ask if you're thinking about adding layers of your secu security to your exams would be to consider things like who has easy access to a photo ID? Um, who has access to a secure testing environment? Uh, who can easily access testing facilities that meet the technical specifications required by your exam? and who's able to schedule work and childcare around testing windows or strict testing time limits. The question I wanted to put to you all, or for us to use the chat box to think about a little bit, would be maybe other reasons why students might not want to show their photo ID for online exams, or other reasons why students may not feel comfortable revealing their testing environment via webcam or being monitored via webcam. Um, there's some things that come to mind for me, but I wanted to put it to the group and use the chat box to just think about, you know, other kinds of issues that might arise from online proctoring and secure assessment. So I'll give folks a few minutes to, to type and I'll, I'll verbally repeat some of the answers.
Um, so folks in the chat are talking about um, cultural reasons or housing insecurity that could make it difficult for folks to, to use secure assessment um, on online proctoring. Something that I thought about was um, with showing photo ID, if someone has a name or gender marker on their ID that doesn't match their identity, they might not want to hold that up to their face for their instructor to see. Um, the ability to access webcams can be a significant barrier. Um, a lot of our students uh, don't have webcam access at home. And um, as I just shared at the beginning of my story, it's not something that most most libraries can support. Um, and the other issue, of course, would be uh, feeling like it invades your privacy, you know, that your um, instructor now knows what your bedroom looks like or what your what your home looks like because they, you had to show it via webcam. Um, I think all of those are, are good points, and there's probably more that, that, we, um, that we haven't thought about. Um, so I think there's valid reasons for students not to want to engage in this kind of proctoring. And one area of research I'd like to look at more, and I, I haven't looked at it much yet, is whether or not students prefer remote versus on-campus proctoring when they have an option. Um, and I think that there are a lot of students, for the reasons we've just talked about, would prefer on-campus proctoring um, instead of being remotely proctored through their webcam or through their browser. So I want to talk next a little bit about um, some exam alternatives and just different approaches, um, just thinking about assessment. Some of these you already mentioned with um, you know, practice assignments, hands-on work discussions. The other big trend that we see, of course, is using problem solving as assessment. Um, specifically, looking at ways to give your students a complex, open-ended problem to solve as a team. And I think the reason that we see so many of these kinds of assignments now is because this is exactly what our students are asked to do in the work world. Um, taking a multiple choice exam is not really something you do outside of um, you know, education scenarios. When you um, are in a department and you have a supervisor and the supervisor gives your team a task and there's not really a clear way to go about it or there might be multiple solutions and you have to figure out the best way to do it, I think all of us work in environments like that every day, um, and that's most likely the kind of work scenario that our students are going to encounter. So giving them a chance to practice those skills is really important. And if you're looking at your course or thinking about what you teach and you're going, Zoe, you know, I really don't know how to do this, or I'm not sure how I could give my students a problem to solve, I think that's a great opportunity to tap into your resources on campus and, and talk to instructional designers and other faculty. The other option I wanted to throw out there, because I've done this in my own classes, um, is I've asked students to write their own final exam. So I know this might sound kind of strange, but these are the assignment instructions I've given my own students. Um, when they write their final exam, they have to use all of the topics that we've covered in the course. They can only use open-ended or short answer questions, so no fill in the blank or multiple choice or true false. They have to use all levels of Bloom's taxonomy. They have to write, of course, an answer key and answer every question. The test has to be worth at least 100 points, and they have to show me that the point value corresponds with the difficulty of the question. And I allow students to work together on this, but every exam should be unique, so there needs to be some differences between them. So obviously, this is a lot of work. You have to teach students how to write an exam, but I'll tell you that I've always found it to be worth it, because the questions that students ask of themselves, the way it forces them to go back and review all their materials, um, the creative uh, exam questions that they come up with, all of it is so much harder than any test I could give them. Um, and I've had students reflect on this experience and ask them, okay, would you have rather you know, taken a final that I gave you or do this assignment? Overwhelmingly, they say they'd rather write their own. And then I ask them, well, what would be harder? Would it be harder to take a test I give you or to do this, like which is more work. Um, and they all agree that, you know, writing their own final and writing that answer key is way more work than just taking a test. So I think this is an example of sort of an alternative kind of assessment that you could do that would get at that big, like, summative exam kind of feel without so much focus on, um, you know, worrying about academic dishonesty. So when you're thinking about your assessments, like I just said a moment ago, you know, you don't have to go at this alone. Make sure that you've talked about your assessments with other faculty in your department. They're probably having some of the same challenges that you are. 
Um, if you're really struggling with your assessments and with academic dishonesty, you know, bring in your dean. They should, they should be a source of support. And if you have instructional designers on your campus, we are the people who want to talk about these things with you. We're happy to help and we're curious about what's going on in your classes and we can help you come up with solutions and talk about different ideas. I want to come back to the story I told um, at the beginning of the session about the student who needed to take their test using the Respondus browser lockdown um, software. And as I've had a few months to think about this anecdote, the thing that's really confusing to me and I'm still not sure about, I know based on what the student shared in that scenario, they weren't in an online class. They were in a face-to-face -face class where their instructor was using Respondus lockdown browser for assessment. So I thought that already was kind of um, an interesting choice that I didn't quite understand. The other thing was this happened really early on in the quarter. This was maybe week one or week two of the quarter. So this wasn't for a midterm and it wasn't for a final. Um, this was an instructor who I think, but I'm not sure, was using Respondus lockdown browser for like a simple quiz um, or something kind of early on in the class. And so as I thought, more about it, I, I really couldn't understand why the instructor was using Lockdown Browser in the scenario where it was a face-to-face -face class and they could have done the quiz in class, um, and where I'm guessing it was a relatively low-stakes assessment um, that maybe didn't need to be locked down in the first place. Maybe it could have just been like a knowledge check in Canvas and, you know, you need to get all the questions right in order to move on to the next thing. So from my perspective, online proctoring makes the most sense to me when the classroom program is completely online, um, on-campus proctoring just isn't an option at all, because um, I do think that helps the students who can't you know, do the off-campus remote proctoring. If you have to use high-stakes cumulative or summative assessments, then I think online proctoring makes sense. And especially if your assessment questions are you know, recall of simple facts or things that can be easily found in a textbook on the web or from their notes, um, then it makes sense. And of course, if you have uh, industry or accreditation standards that require you to use it, um, then I would understand uh, making that choice. So those are just some of my thoughts and kind of my big picture approach um, to thinking about how to integrate online proctoring and secure assessments into instructional design. Uh, we have a, a little bit of time now. I'd love to use the chat box or if folks want to use their microphones to just have a discussion. Um, share something new that you learned today, something you want to try or change in your teaching. And of course, if you have questions, um, feedback, or ideas, I'd love to hear those as well. So I'll turn it over to the, to the chat box and see what folks want to talk about. So I got a great question in the chat box. Somebody says, how much time is involved in grading the Write Your Own Quiz? Um, to be honest, I found them pretty quick to assess. Um, I make a rubric that involves um, the components that I mentioned on that instruction screen. Um, for me, the big thing that I looked at was students have to use um, all different levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So I did have to go through their test and make sure that they had done that and to make sure that they had really comprehensively addressed the topics in the course. So if they only mention, you know, the 10-week class, and let's say there's 10 big themes, if they only mention two or three of the course topics, then um, that would impact their grade. But in general, I found that students put so much time and energy into them and really did so well and impressed me so much. Um, most people scored really highly on that and did very well, and the folks who didn't, you know, there are people who ran out of time who um, didn't put very much energy or attention into the assignment, um, and they probably were going to struggle, you know, maybe no matter what kind of assessment I had given them. So um, to be honest, I found them pretty quick to grade because they were just really well done, they met standards, and I had a clear rubric that showed what I was looking for. Um, and there's a comment that letting students design their own assessment sounds really interesting and great for including some universal design for learning principles. Um, and there's another comment that says a study showing that online students do not cheat more um, was interesting and it makes me think that maybe I'm focusing too much time and energy on stopping cheating. 
Um, for what it's worth, it's my philosophy as an instructional designer that if you design your course in such a way that there's really high value assessments that can be very easily um, cheated, <laughs> uh, students who are trying to do the work quickly um, and effectively may choose to do it in a way that's not um, ethical or not honest. But if you make those things that are the easiest for cheating the, the lowest value or even no value, um, I think that's a helpful approach because uh, and maybe it's just a helpful uh, philosophy to keep in mind kind of as we emphasized at the beginning. If people really want to cheat, they're going to find a way. So putting a lot of your time and energy into stopping that maybe isn't isn't the best um, focus, you know. And I think talking to instructional designers about uh, the different kinds of assessments you give or how to weight those assessments, um, you know, we can help you think through that and give you some options. But I have so much respect for instructors and the energy and attention you give to students, and I think it's better suited uh, put into other areas than, than trying to be the academic dishonesty police. So that's just my own take on it. Um, so I think I answered the question about the, the grading and there's been a couple other comments. Anything else that folks want to share? I know we're getting to the top of the hour and so um, people might need to run. Hey Zoe, this is Alyssa. I actually do have a question for you. Um, yeah. Do you have any examples of a complex, open-ended problem that you've given to your class to solve as a team, just like something you've done in the past? Or does letting them design their own assessment kind of fall into that because it is an open-ended problem that they have to solve? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I can speak to some of the work I've done teaching Info 101, which is like a research skills class. Um, and I think obviously we come across a lot of topics in the research and information world that don't have easy answers. I'll say that um, this wasn't necessarily something I presented them as a problem, but I did have them do um, a discussion in a small group or a pair, and they had to do it synchronously, even though this was an online class, so I said, hey, you need to call each other or meet on campus or something. And I gave them um, one of our course readings to talk about, and of course now I can't remember it, but it was something about, um, I think maybe it was about you know, the problem of predatory publishing or something like that. And I think I said, you know, in a group discuss this reading and like, how would you solve this problem? You know, how would you stop predatory publishers from, you know, publishing fake science and fake journals? What could be done about it? So I didn't put it to them to actually like design a solution, but I did put them like, hey, discuss this. And then the actual um, thing they turned into me was like a reflection of the discussion. So because they have the discussion either on the phone or in person, it wasn't a discussion board, but they talked about it. And then they wrote up a reflection of, you know, here's what I contributed, here's what other people had to say. Another example I can give, um, again, in this sort of the information science world, a friend of mine did an activity with students where he had them design their own citation style. <laughs> he said, you know, okay, you know, MLA and APA exist, but if you had to design something brand new, what would it look like and what would be involved in it? And I think that's another example of, you know, finding something within your discipline where maybe there's not a clear, easy right answer and having folks work together to come up with something. So nice. That's a great question. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thanks for answering it. No, All right. Thanks for the time. Yeah, this was great. I, the next page, I just, I push for the next, um, webinar, which is going to be in a couple weeks. I know you're going to promote it, Alyssa, but I'm really excited because it's about information literacy, so I'm okay. looking forward to it. Yeah, great. Yeah, I'll talk about um, Derek's presentation here in just a second. Are there any last um, questions for Zoe? Anything you want to add in the chat or ask her? Uh, please feel free to um, go ahead and uh, do that while I close us out. Um, we do have our next webinar that will be um, the fourth webinar of this season, and um, that'll be on May 17th, and it's Humanizing and Personalizing Information Literacy, and that will feature Derek Jorgensen, and I just noticed, I think I spelled his name wrong here on the slide, it's O-N, I believe, um, so I'll have to fix that, I guess. Uh, he's an instructional designer and associate faculty at Everett Community College, so um, we are looking forward to that, and coincidentally, his presentation is also on Global Accessibility Awareness Day, so um, feel free to join us. There will be all sorts of presentations actually going on all over the net for um, the Global Accessibility uh, Day. So um, just uh, feel free to tune in to us or, um, you know, another presentation that interests you. Um, here's our contact information for Mark and myself. 
Um, please contact us if you have any questions about accessing the resources or want to know about more about IGNIS or want to find out about maybe presenting next year. We do put a call out to presenters, um, a call for proposals every fall, um, kind of late in the fall, just after, um, usually just after Halloween, we, we do a call for um, proposals and um, that's where we source. We source every, all of these great proposals from within our own system. Um, so if you're interested in finding more about that, um, finding out more, um, give me a shout and I'll give you some details on that. And I think that's it for today. So I thank you all for coming. And um, everything in our presentations, uh, we're CC by license. So feel free to take it, adapt it, and use it for your own purposes if you want to. And um, thanks again for attending. And looks like we're actually closing out on time despite our little bit of a late start. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.